And then I Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to tonight's presentation. We're very honored to have Smith Aaron Kane, the superintendent of Douglas County School District, here with us today. And thank you to those of you who are joining us on Zoom. We are recording it and we will post it to our website and share out in our newsletter. Um, I would like to go ahead and just do some brief introductions. Uh, we have joining us also this evening our interim CEO of Closed On Schools, Dr. Karen Johnson. 
Hi, everybody. And then we have Ms. Pogolesky. <laughs> <laughs> we have Ms. Pogolesky, uh, Lenian Pogolesky. She's our STEM Executive Director. And we have Ms. Erin Kane, the Superintendent of Douglas County School. And with that, I will hand it over to Ms. Kane. Yes. We'll start her presentation. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, good evening, and I'd also like to introduce uh, two of our Board of Education Directors that came tonight. Um, so President Mike Peterson is in the back. And Director, Director Susan Meehan, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate both of you being here um, as we talk about funding, and they can certainly jump in and share their perspective um, as people ask questions. So, and hello to everyone on Zoom. Thank you so much for having us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, so what I'm planning on talking about tonight is a little bit about how our school district is funded and then what um, the superintendent, me and our my staff have recommended to the Board of Education as far as the ballot initiative goes in uh, November of 2022. This presentation is very similar to the one that I gave to the Board of Education on August 9th. So that's what I'll be going through. Um, and at the end, I'm more than happy to take questions about funding or questions about the school district generally, whatever anyone would like to ask, I'm happy to answer. Um, so we'll be talking about why we're having funding challenges and STEM is having funding challenges, the district is having funding challenges, why is that in the wealthiest county um, in our state, um, what our recommendation was to the Board of Education and what the impact will be on our taxpayers, and um, and then a little bit into detail about what we would spend the money on in terms of a mill levy override and a bond. Um, we'll even look at the ballot language and talk about what next steps are. So for me, I always start with our kids. Um, everything always starts with our kids. And whether our kids attend a charter school, attend a district-run school, wherever our kids go, I think we all want the same thing for our students as a community in Douglas County. We want to make sure that Douglas County School District is a destination district and a place where people want to come from across the country to teach from across the country to send their kids where companies want to come to Douglas County so that their employees have access to our awesome school system. This is something that would benefit our entire community, whether they send kids to our schools or not. We want to make sure that all of the kids that go through our system, whether they're matriculating here in STEM or matriculating through a district run school, that they are able to have the greatest possible future. And then we're really looking at making sure that we're giving our kids a pathway to success to their future career, whether that's setting them up for a college education or setting them up for a career immediately out of high school or setting them up for both. We want to make sure that our kids have the brightest futures possible and that they're able to feed into local industry. I've been here for 22 years. My children grew up here in Douglas County. It is my sincere hope that at least one of my three children, probably more, settle here in Douglas County and raise their kids here. And I think so many of us have done that. So many of us are graduates of schools that are local and stayed here because it's so wonderful. So we want to make sure that we're feeding the local industry, our future graduates, and getting them ready to work here or anywhere. And we want to make sure that every single one of our schools is a point of pride in our community, whether it's a neighborhood school or a charter school, that we're all a point of pride for our community. That's part of my district. That school is part of my district in preparing kids for their future. So I just wanna talk a little bit about how state funding works for school districts, because the number one question I get, is how is it possible that public schools in the wealthiest county in Colorado are actually struggling for funding, especially as our property taxes are going up because our valuations are going up, our cities are thriving, our county is thriving, our police department is thriving, our libraries are thriving. What is the school district doing with all of the money? And the answer is actually the School Finance Act from 1994. That's the act that determines how public schools are funded. Under the School Finance Act, each school district is, is given a total funding amount for the school year by the state legislature. And that total funding amount is calculated based on a number of factors. So think of that as our bucket. So the state legislature sets our bucket size each year. The bucket is first filled with local property tax dollars. And then the state fills in the difference to the top of the bucket. 
What that means is when property taxes go up in our state, when we collect more locally, we just get less from the state. It doesn't change our total funding picture. That's what makes us different from the libraries in the city or the county, um, is that just as we get more property taxes locally, we get less from the state. The only way that we have local control to change the size of our bucket is through a mill levy override. We can raise up to 25% more funding through the mill levy override. And in Douglas County, our taxpayers have approved about 12% more. So we get 12% more funding through the mill levy override. Our challenge is other school districts. Other school districts are at that 25% level or near that 25% level and are receiving more money per student through their local mill levy override than Douglas County is, which makes it really, really hard for us to compete. And that challenge has become worse over time. So if you can see this graph from the sun, the challenge over time is back in 2011, we were pretty close. We didn't have a huge gap, but as time went forward and other school districts passed multiple mill levy overrides, the gap between us with the red line and the other school districts became significantly bigger. Today, the gap between Douglas County School District and Cherry Creek School District in our mill levy override funding is $2,000 a student. And so put another way, you can see through this chart what other districts' fundings look like. And again, the bucket is boxed in with the black. And everyone's bucket is filled with local funding and then state funding fills in the difference. The differentiator though is truly the mill levy override, which is the gray um, amount on the top. So again, um, I've got Douglas County all the way on the right with Cherry Creek right next to us because they're like right there. And that's where the teachers go. Um, and it's $2,000 per student difference in mill levy override money times our student count. And you can do this math for STEM as well. Times our student count, $2,000 a student is $124 million a year. Of course, we can't pay our teachers competitively. It's just math. We absolutely can't pay our teachers competitively. And we really are struggling. Um, and our, I know our charter schools are struggling even more than we are on average. This is average teacher salary according to the Colorado Department of Education numbers um, from 21-22. This average teacher salary for all of these districts is inclusive of district salaries as well as charter school salaries. Our average teacher salary, all of us together, is $58,000 a year in 21-22. Cherry Creek School District's average teacher salary is $76,000. It's a difference of $18,000. It's an enormous difference. Um, and you all know teachers are just like all of us. They're putting kids through college, they're raising families. An increase of almost $20,000 a year is enormous. And it's making, really, it's making it really, really hard for all of us to hold on to our teaching staff. And it isn't just teachers. Um, for us, for our district-run schools, it's everything. And I think it's everything for our charter schools as well. Educational assistants, custodians, bus drivers, assistant principals, principals, no one is paid competitively because of that, that giant $124 million gap that can only be resolved through a local mill levy override. From a district lens, I often get asked, well, just cut overhead. Surely you can just cut overhead and make it better. And we can. We really have looked at how much we can possibly tighten um, overhead spending in central administration. The, the graphs you see in front of you, the pie on the left is our overall spending. At Douglas County School District, we spend 85% of our money on salary and benefits, which means 85% of our money goes to our people. Our charter schools are perhaps a slightly lesser percentage of that than that due to mortgage payments, but also the majority of a charter school's money is going to its people. When the, for the school district, when we break off just the people and we look at the people, only 4% of our people account for school-based administrators, and only 1% of our people account for central, uh, central administration-based administrators. So truly, we're very, very skinny in Douglas County School District on administration. Um, we have 8,500 employees. We have 23 human resources professionals in central administration. That's one HR professional. We're 370 employees. Industry standard is one to 50. Other districts is about one to 100 or one to 250. So we are very skinny all across the board. On the capital side, for school districts, 
The way that the law was written in 1994, local control was very much contemplated when the law was written. Part of local control is that local communities are responsible for building and maintaining their own schools. We're responsible for building and maintaining our own libraries. We're responsible for building and maintaining our own uh, justice center, et cetera. We're also responsible for building and maintaining our own schools. And we did that from 1994 all the way through 2006 here in Douglas County, we passed a bond for the school district, which pays for building and maintaining schools every three to four years, on average, every three and a half years, just like that, you know, for three and a half years, and it allowed us to build all the schools that we have in Island Ranch, Kesserov, Parker, all the neighborhood schools that we have were built through those bonds. Um, and then we went for 12 years with no capital funding whatsoever to maintain all of those buildings. And the buildings all fell into district care um, because the, the district does not have any kind of capital um, funding stream. There's no magic building carry. The state doesn't provide significant amount of capital funding. It really needs to come from our taxpayers. Um, and so that 12 years caused our buildings in the district to really degrade. So when we passed the bond in 2018, we were able to at least get our buildings to where they were safe, they were heated and cooled, they had roofs that didn't leak, um, and, and in a better shape. Um, bond money was also shared with our charter schools that had older buildings and had the same needs that the district did. That's why we need another bond, because we need to look forward. We've got 111 buildings in our district, inclusive of all of our charter schools. Um, that we, we the, the community, are responsible for maintaining. And we need to look forward. That costs 30 to $35 million a year in capital maintenance to maintain the buildings that, that we have. And that's never going to go away. I mean, the capital maintenance will be forever, which is why we used to be on more or less a regular cycle. And the other challenge we have is growth. So we're seeing a lot of growth in Douglas County in various pockets. We haven't built a neighborhood school or a district run school since 2010. Um, as someone who ran a charter system for a very long time and is a huge advocate of school choice, I'm an advocate of school choice and parent choice. And there is a place for uh, charter schools and there is a place for our neighborhood schools. And we have the best combination here in Douglas County at about 75 25. Our parents who choose to send their kids to a neighborhood school, their choice matters. Parents who chose to send their kids to a charter school, their choice matters. Um, and we need to be able to have those anchor neighborhood schools for our new, newer communities. And then we can help have our charter schools help us fill in growth. Um, it's, but it, it, it takes a unique combination. Um, and as I said, we haven't built a new neighborhood school since 2010. So the staff recommended to the Board of Education that they consider a $60 million mill levy override and a $450 million bond. And I want to be really clear with their taxpayers on the 600, on the 600, um, I'm sorry, the $60 million mill levy override that would provide about $943 a student. So it's not going to, it's not going to close that $2,000 per student gap, but it's going to get us a whole lot closer. And it's a reasonable ask for taxpayers. You have to balance what's a reasonable ask with how close can we get in terms of closing the gap. On the capital funding side, our master capital plan calls for five new schools in the next five years and about 800 million. So inclusive of those five schools, about 800 million in capital investment in the next five years. We can't do that. We're not going to ask for an 800 million dollar bond, but we are going to ask for a 400 or we're recommending that we ask for a 450 million dollar bond. But I want to give everyone some perspective about how much that really is going to cover. And the impact on our taxpayers of the two initiatives together is a dollar a week per $100,000 in home value. Um, so if you have a $500,000 home, that's $5 a week um, times $2 a year. That's what your cost would be as a taxpayer every year. But the way that this breaks down is it's the mill levy override side that costs the dollar a week per $100,000. And you'll see this later in my presentation. The bond by itself, the $450 million bond, actually is a no impact bond, meaning it won't change the mills that are being collected right now. It's a little like your mortgage payment. When you buy a house and you have a mortgage payment, over time you refinance your mortgage and you're able to decrease your mortgage payment, but maybe you fill it in with a key lock so that you can finish your basement. So now you're paying your same mortgage payment, but you have a finished basement. 
Um, the bonds work very similarly. There comes a time when the bond is going to step down and we can fill it in with a new payment for a new bond without a net impact on taxpayers. On the melody over, override side, we're keeping it really simple. Um, it would be for compensation in order to be more competitive. Um, we do allocate our mill levy overrides to our charter schools, of course, so our dollars follow the students within the Douglas County School District umbrella, so that approximately $943 a student, um, about $15.5 million of that would go to our charter schools, which our charter schools have all indicated to us that they need it for the same reason we do, which is to have their pay be more competitive for their people. And about $44.5 million would go to um, the school district to address pay in the school district. And the taxpayer impact, again, of that mill levy override is a dollar per 100000 in value, a um, dollar a week per 100000 in value, or $51 a year per 100000 in value. So for a half a million dollars a uh, home, it's $255 a year. It's about $510 a year for a million dollars. So again, we are trying to keep the... We ask at a reasonable place, especially understanding what kind of economy we're in. Um, the other thing I want to say about the impact, because our mill levy override and bond are both based on dollar amounts, that means that when our valuations go higher, which they're about to, when our valuations go higher, the tax won't increase with the valuation. It stays at that dollar amount. And in fact, the more houses that that fixed dollar amount is spread over, that there'll be a diminishing impact on any individual taxpayer over time. Um, and for the district, we will be spending our compensation about 70% about of our total compensation goes to our licensed staff, so our teachers, and about 30% goes to our non-licensed staff, so our support staff, our administrators, et cetera. And where we would divide our share from the levy override accordingly. Um, each of the charter schools can work out how they want to manage their compensation changes based on what they would get for their individual charter schools. Uh, so I won't belabor what the school district is doing for our employees um, because it will be unique to your charter school. Once the mill, if the mill levy override passes, this is that same chart, but what we would look like post passage. So the last bar on the left would be Douglas County School District in the event of the mill levy override passes. So you can see where, where again, we're still not where Cherry Creek is, but we're a lot more competitive, particularly with Littleton and Jefferson County. And it's a really great start. On the bond side, um, the staff recommendation again is that $450 million bond. That bond would build three new elementary schools in, in communities that are just exploding. Sterling Ranch, Crystal Valley, um, and the canyons. Those three communities are exploding and are about to overcrowd every school that's anywhere near them, whether it's an neighborhood school or a park school. Um, and those, so those are the ones that are truly on fire that we really need to get that neighborhood school into. We're also looking at expanding two middle schools in Parker, which will save us the money of building a new elementary school in those two areas. And of course, expanding a middle school is more fiscally responsible. Um, that's the new construction piece that we're looking at um, as far as capital maintenance, our capital maintenance includes um, includes our charter schools as well as our neighborhood schools. And in fact, there are a lot of items in there for STEM because STEM jumped over the age requirements. You're just old enough um, that, that truly the bond on the charter side is very heavy for STEM and for Skyview and somewhat for American Academy's first campus, all because of the year that um, those three schools were built and how old they were. So suddenly opt into the, now you need a new room and new, a new stuff. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> it's one of those, now we're finally old enough where the gray, you know, whatever, <laughs> all this stuff. Um, I Back to that, the taxpayer impact of that $450 million bond. As I mentioned, it's a net zero impact. So it actually wouldn't change the mills that we pay today as homeowners. But in full disclosure, if the bond were to not have Again, that payment is going to step down. So if the bond were to not pass, taxpayers would save um, a small amount, about $10 a year per $100,000 in home value. So there would be a slight decrease um, if the bond does not pass. But if the Don bond does pass, again, it's a $0 tax impact. And so these are the new construction recommendations in more detail. 
Um, these are programming recommendations, which cover um, the school district side of things. And then uh, the security upgrades, we would do security upgrades across the district um, to include all of our district-run schools, as well as our charter schools, to make sure that we all have the latest and greatest equipment and radio communication, um, and cameras, and all of those things, um, as we did with the 2018 bond. And then capital maintenance and renewal is also inclusive, as I said, of our charter schools. Um, and then we need new buses. We have school buses that have 300,000 miles and more um, that we need to replace. This is a little bit about the ballot language that we are recommending. So uh, the ballot language for 5A would talk about competitive compensation. And that's actually really important because that not only locks us in, it locks charter schools in as well. So if taxpayers pass this ballot language, that means that all of us have to use these millennium right dollars on competitive compensation, which our charter leaders have indicated to me is not a problem because that's where they're all dying as well. So um, that's that's where that money would go. On the bond side, um, in our recommended language, we were able to include something about how it's a zero impact on mills. Um, and again, we've kind of listed generally what the bond would be used for along with a reference to the bond plan that is published on the district website. So if you actually go look at our district website, there's a big link on the top that says my DTSD funding information. And you click on that and you can actually see what projects are being funded by school to include STEM. Um, so you'll actually be able to see kind of what specific projects will be covered. And we did make sure that we got an asterisk that says, you know, over the course of five years, things happen and priorities might shift. And so we have the ability to trade projects in and out if we need to, as long as we're um, transparent about that on our website to our customers. Both um, ballots also include the language around a citizen-based committee that would um, oversee the spending. So that's the Mill Bond Oversight Committee or the MBOC. They are currently in place overseeing the spending of the 2018 bond. Um, and so if we were to be successful in November, the board would continue the MBOC to oversee the 2022 bonds. So it's a citizen-based committee that looks at the spending and compares it with ballot language and the plan that was published by the school district and reports out quarterly to the public, as well as to the Board of Education to validate that yes, indeed, the money is being spent the way that we were told it would be spent. So next steps for um, the school district in terms of actually making this happen, August 23rd, so Tuesday, um, is our next board meeting. And at that board meeting, the Board of Education will consider resolutions to put that ballot language into ballot language that, that they decide upon, but that staff's recommended ballot language on the November 22 ballot. Once that happens, a switch flips. So, once they approve putting that, assuming they do, they approve to put that on the ballot, then all of us who work in the school district or work for a charter school are obligated to the Fair Campaign Practices Act, meaning we cannot use school or district resources to promote a bond millennium override. We can absolutely continue to educate our public on how our schools are funded and what our challenges are, but we can't use district resources to promote a bond millennium override in any kind of way. The district will be providing fair campaign act information to our staff as well as to our charter schools to distribute um, so that everyone kind of understands what they can and can't do. Certainly, all of us, though, are individual citizens as well. And as individual citizens, um, we have the right to go out there and do whatever we want. Um, and so that's what that looks like. And then again, that, that PMBOK committee would be continued if um, a ballot initiative were to be successful. So with that, I am more than happy to take any questions from in person or online that I can answer. So, and thank you very much for giving me the time to go through all of that. Yes. Do they do they review both the capital side, both parts of it? They yes, do, right? they do. They do. They over they um, review the middle of the override spending. Um, plan versus what's actually being spent, as well as the capital site. So they do do both. And there are openings on the Mill Bond Oversight Committee. So should anybody want to be interested, you know, would be interested in being part of that oversight, um, we need we need citizens. So we need citizens to come and be involved and make sure 
that we're doing all the right things that we need to be doing from a What else can we answer? We'll take board questions as well. You yes. For myself, President Peterson and Director Meek, do you have to answer questions too? Um, have you done polling? And if so, what's it showing? We did do polling. So um, we did polling back in May, and there uh, the board had put in place a mill bond exploratory committee, and, and that um, in order to look into the feasibility of potentially putting a bond ability over it on a ballot. And a polling was part of that, and the polling was not good. It was about 39% um, in May. It was about 39% approval. Um, it's tough. It's tough because the economy is tough. Um, it's tough because there's been a lot of stuff. It's tough because our taxpayers don't necessarily understand how our public schools are funded. I found that once I talk to people about how the funding actually works, they're always like, oh my goodness, I, I got to get on that. So um, a lot of this has been a big effort to get out to our taxpayers. We're fully aware that this is going to be an uphill battle um, and that all of us, staff, our seven board members, um, our charter schools, all of us are going to have to work very hard to educate our community. But that being said, with a $2,000 differential between our average teacher salary and Cherry Creek's average teacher salary, I don't know how I look my teachers in the eye and not try. That at least is mine personally. Two thousand student, right? Two thousand dollars per student. Yes, yeah, sorry, the twenty thousand, almost twenty thousand dollars difference in salaries. Yes, two thousand dollars a student. Thank you. Anything else? Any other questions? You know, I guess I kind of wonder why, if we are the wealthiest county in Colorado, why we're trying to hit middle of the road. Why don't we just ask for what we really need to be the best school district people want to come and work at um, and just push that rather than always kind of trying to play catch up with the middle of the road. When I don't think, I know me as a parent and as I mean, working with schools, you know, constantly feeling like you're grappling to do what you need to do to keep people, to keep that community going. Um, you know, I just, I had several friends say this year to go work at Cherry Creek, go work at Jeffco. I made $20,000 more and have a lot less stress. You know, I, I think that um, at least when we looked at staff's recommendation, um, if we go in too big and don't pass it at all, we're definitely not. Going to pass it. So we really had to balance what we thought we could realistically pass. Um, you know, if you go in, if I get, we have a $74 million um, mill levy override in this district right now before this initiative. And that's been mill levy overrides in small increments since the late 80s. Um, so going in all at once with a $120 million mill levy override um, during an inflationary period, I think would have been, uh, a, at least from my own standpoint, I think would have been such a big ask that that our chances for passage would have been so much less. Um, I definitely know we won't be more competitive if we get zero, right? So it's just a matter of, but I am trying to be as transparent as possible about 60 million is really going to help. It's going to get us a good amount of the way there, but it is not a magic wand that is going to make everything all better. Um, we probably will be back. Ask me again. Now, the good news is this rat race of like constantly trying to keep up is slowing down because there is a limit. There is a limit as to how much, how high those other districts can go. And most of them have just about reached that limit. So as we're working on catching up, as you say, which is 100% true, at least, at least they're not continuing to get further and further away. Well, we have the governor to send us all checks. Like, is there any movement to try and get the like the state law change to handle this so it's not always put on the county? Well, so yes, um, the answer is of course because state statewide um, funding is also an issue. So there's an issue with statewide funding as well as um, district wide funding. But what's really hard is if you look at the state funding piece, and that's the part that's black boxed. We're, we're, more, we're not equal, but we're really pretty close. And the ones that have more have more students at risk and have, have re their reasons that, that they get a little bit more per student than Douglas County School District gets per student. This is really a local challenge. The gray is local. And I, I don't know if we get to go to the state and say, 
well, you know, I know Cherry Creek's willing to pay more, but we're not, so we think you should pay it instead. I, I'm not sure that that's a really great argument. We either kind of believe in local control or we don't, at least yeah. from, from my point of view. Um, and so I think it's a hard argument to say, we don't, we're the wealthiest county, but we don't want to pay the extra dollars, so we think the state should get um, that's that's a really hard argument. President Peterson? Yeah. Here, I'm going to give you the mic so you can hear me online. And one of the things there is rising capital salt votes. So even if state funding is increasing like we think it will be, yeah. that gap remains the same. So we're back to the competitiveness. You know, if everybody's increasing dollars, that eighteen thousand dollar gap in average pay from Cherry Creek would still be a magnet going that way. So we need to close the gap. But like Superintendent King said, um, the rest are all kind of right about that twenty five cap. Now there's some little micro things you can do there to, to try to to mess with it. Um, but that's where we can definitely make it up. When you talked about us being middle of the road, we're not when we talk about the results, mm -hmm. right? We are, you know, arguably by objective data, all the benchmarks, the best district in the Denver metro area in terms of scoring. CDE's been releasing their data over the last two years around learning loss, did it slow down, did it plateau, did it in fact fall off all around Colorado? And what's coming out is very good for Douglas County. So I think the proposition that we're trying to keep uh, to with our taxpayers and all our parents and students and staff is we're going to give you the best value in terms of excellent economic performance for a reasonable PPR. In fact, if you talk percentages, everybody else did in 25, if I get this right, Superintendent King, because we're doing a fixed dollar amount, it'll spike and then decrease over time. It's about a 22% initial ask, but average over the time of the MLO would be about 19%. So you're really getting excellent scores, excellent values, really rewarding our staff, both licensed and non-licensed, but still doing it in an incredible value. And that's just a testament to our district, our leadership, and, and our teachers. Many people just add, I mean, I'm speaking of one more number, I think it's both state and local. I mean, Colorado is in terms of least competitive innovation. Right. So color has to attract teachers for us to even attract teachers. So it's it's a big problem. And so even if you look at ours on the far right, it looks like we're getting from the state and the majority of the state. And so I guess I'm more speaking to that. Like Colorado is one of the lowest yeah, states in the country for funding schools. Why don't we address that and have Colorado just do better across the board for all of our districts? And then we still have the ability for that local control. That's what I mean. Is there any move for that? I mean, I one more number. I think yes. <laughs> it needs to be both. Yeah. Thank you. No, and there and there definitely is a lot of discussion at the state level about uh, funding for education. Um, when I served as interim superintendent, I was part of a superintendent's committee that developed a new formula um, that that to us that was a very student centered formula that would make sense, but um, until there's a revenue change at the state level, that's that's going to continue to be an issue. And yes, we should advocate for funding at the state level. Um, but as President Peterson said, you know, my job is Douglas County School District and to make sure that we can hold on to teachers. And if someone else is offering them twenty thousand dollars more, regardless of where where that base is, that's a huge problem for us. Um, and so that what we can, you know, this is in scope of something we can control as a community. Um, and that's that's why we're advocating for it. Yes, sir. Looking numbers, running numbers or statistics for the reason other than finance for why people may be willing to consider it. Thank you very much for that question. We do track, at least as a school district, I can't speak for our charter schools, but we do track um, why why our teachers leave and what they're going towards. Is it more money? Are they staying home with a child? Are they moving out of state? So we do track that. Um, and we do find that most of them, it's a, it's a money issue. Um, when I just uh, was able to host our new teacher summer summit. So this is again for the district where we had new teachers coming into our district. Um, and I asked people to stand up if they were returning to our district from another district, and it was a huge number of people. So we do have people that are starting to return to Douglas County School District, even though we're not able to pay competitively because we have we have amazing families in this community. We have incredible families, incredible kids who are 
Our families are so supportive. Our kids are awesome. It's a wonderful community to live in. There are so many advantages that we have. If we can just get a little closer competitively, we can work collectively in the community, whether it's me as a superintendent looking at our district run school, or whether it's Lynn here at STEM or Karen here at STEM working on culture and climate, working on all those things that, that make our employees so passionate and want to stay with us. And those are all big factors as well. But boy, $20,000 is a tough, that's a tough thing to overcome. Especially again, they're just like I have three kids in college. Like they're just like us, right? They're trying to commit kids to college. They're they're trying to figure out if they can afford for a parent to stay at home. Like all the same things that all of us have that we all worried about, you know, since we were young parents. So um so did I hopefully I got everyone's questions. Are there any questions online? We have one, but I answered it. Oh, good <laughs> job. It was about your it was about seeing your presentation. So Good job. Well, I really want to thank you all for coming out tonight and thank you to those that are joining us online on the recording. Um, I'll stick around for a few minutes and I imagine President Peterson and Director Meek will also um, maybe hang out for a couple of minutes with me. If you have any questions um, as you're walking out that we can help you with, let us know. And we're also only an email away. So thank you so much for hosting us and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Here we go. You got it. Thank you.